Okay, welcome everybody to today's uh, webinar. And uh, it's good to see so many people coming in and from all over the world. As you can see on the map below, we have a, a wide cross section of the world population from uh, four continents with us today. So welcome everybody. My name is Alistair Creelman. I'm in Sweden at Linnaeus University. <coughs> and I, I'm part of a project called Moonlight, which is looking at the use of um, MOOCs and open education with refugees in particular, and even for employability. This webinar is also being run in association with the organizations you can see up here, EDEN, the European Distance and E-Learning Network, the Nordic Network for Adult Education, and the Swedish Network for IT and Higher Education. So welcome wherever you've come from. Uh, I'll apologize, first of all, that I have a slightly interesting voice today because uh, I lost it yesterday and I'm just beginning to find it again. So if I sound a little bit strange, uh, I apologize. But you'll be glad to know you'll mostly be listening to the people who are sitting next to me who can introduce themselves briefly just now. Agnes. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Agnes Kogolska Hume. I'm Professor of Learning Technology and Communication. I'm based at the Open University in the UK, and I work there in the Institute of Educational Technology. So, I'm going to be talking today about some of the projects that we've been um, conducting with the migrants using mobile technologies. So today's seminar um, is sort of divided in two halves, tackling both mobile and, um, and MOOC uh, approaches to learning, uh, which I believe are complementary. Thank you. Tim? Thank you, Alistair. Hello, everybody. <laughs> My name's uh, Tim Reed. I'm a, a senior lecturer at um, the Spanish National Distance University, UNED, in Madrid, in Spain. I'm the uh, Joint Pro Vice Chancellor of um, Methodology and Technology, and I actually um, worked in the program to set up our MOOC program um, back in, in 2012. So I look forward to discussing these questions with you this afternoon. Yes, uh, it's very much about sort of the one of the key issues, of course, for anyone uh, in a situation of having moved from one country to another for because of war or because of uh, various economic issues and poverty and so on. When you come to your new country, you've got to learn a language. And sometimes language learning is not available immediately. Sometimes you have to use informal methods. And that's the topic today. How far can we help refugees using mobile apps? Most of them have mobiles. Apps look like a very good way of giving some kind of support. But how can we build on that? Open courses like MOOCs are available very easily all over the world, completely free to enter. But are they really applicable for learning languages? And what are the experiences of that? During this webinar, I'd like you to keep using the chat down there. Give your ideas. <clears throat> we want to hear from you. Some of you have started putting links. These links are clickable. They'll be clickable in the recording. So don't be afraid to give us some useful links to other projects, other initiatives, or services and tools that you know about. It's all part of building up a, a knowledge base for all of us. However, you, will, you do not have uh, voice and video capability because since we have so many people interested in this, I think it would be rather technically challenging to let everybody be able to speak and be seen. So I hope you will bear with us with that. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to change view and let uh, Agnes start. And she's going to start by asking you a question. Thank you very much for that, Alistair. So we thought we'd kick off with this question, um, which is, in your experience, are apps on smartphones helpful in language learning? 
So this may be your personal experience or uh, it may be the experience of your learners that you're drawing on or teachers that you educate. So it will be interesting just to see uh, initial reactions. So if you can choose one of the app, uh, options there, um, which is that they are helpful uh, or not, <laughs> and then we'll be able to see. So far, we're getting quite positive responses uh, with people saying that many apps are helpful. So that's a good start. You're all kind of um, uh, mostly positively disposed towards this, uh, this topic, I think. However, some people, one so far, is saying that um, apps are generally not helpful. Okay, um, so that's, that's a good uh, thing to know at the, at the start. And uh, in this uh, short talk, I'm going to be sharing with you some experiences from our recent projects, supporting mainly migrants, um, but we're also um, starting to do some work um, with refugee learners in both formal and informal contexts. But uh, today I'm concentrating on the informal mobile learning that uh, we've been exploring through uh, numerous projects. And this work that we're doing is um, part of the Learning Futures program activity that we have uh, ongoing at um, the Open University. So trying to push the boundaries of uh, online and mobile learning and um, populations like migrants and refugees are uh, excellent groups uh, from whom we can learn and with whom we can develop innovative uh, learning um, opportunities. So as I see it, the um, major challenge that we face nowadays is that there is a great abundance of mobile apps and other um, online resources that can be used on smartphones for language learning. Um, that can be done in an informal way on a daily basis, integrated with daily life. So the opportunity is there. And uh, people like newly arrived migrants and refugees can, in principle, take advantage of such learning opportunities. But of course, we know that there are lots of uh, issues uh, also involved. And one that I thought I would highlight today is that many people are not used to being in charge of their own learning. So the use of mobile apps and resources assumes to an extent that the learner is self-directed, perhaps self-motivated to pursue their learning and knows how to do that. And um, furthermore, uh, such informal and uh, often self-directed learning may be um, something that is complementary to the formal classes that people are attending, but it could also end up being in conflict with such formal education. So for example, the, the, the pace of progress may be different or the um, uh, people's aims or the actual uh, language that's covered in, in those classes or in those online resources may, uh, may differ and so on. So the big question for us all is how can we support migrants and refugees in their transition to a new country and at the same time, a new way of learning? So I, as I see it, this learning, um, this new way of learning is learning through apps and online resources, and it's new for everyone, not just for migrants and refugees. But when we do think about those specific populations, we can think about uh, what characterizes them. They're learning on the move, often in the midst of very challenging events and circumstances. They may be catching up on missed education, and therefore uh, they may need uh, to be able to work more quickly or uh, more slowly. Um, they may need greater flexibility. They may also be looking for new 
openings and opportunities. So changing direction with regard to what their previous, uh, what, what they previously uh, were studying and what they perhaps need now in their new circumstances. The learning uh, typically needs to be well situated, well connected to their daily life, their life experiences, their current needs, and their um, their new goals, perhaps the things that they uh, will need to do in their new life. With regard to um, their prior experience of digital learning or learning with uh, smartphones, there will obviously be, ob obviously be a range of uh, prior experiences and expectations. Uh, the um, people have different um, life experiences in education. They may um, have previously only experienced classroom learning with a teacher. They may or may not be ready for digital learning in one form or another. And finally, um, we know that the journey of the migrant and refugee is a journey that includes some kind of movement towards social integration and inclusion. And uh, perhaps uh, learning uh, the language can help towards that, both in classrooms and out in the community. So we've been conducting a number of projects, which I'm just going to touch on very briefly. Um, but uh, one of these uh, is the project called Salsa, where we were really trying to get to grips with situated mobile learning in towns and cities. So here the um, emphasis is on supporting people as they learn and also um, as they uh, explore a new environment the town where they're now living, or the city where they're now based. So in this project, small um, beacons were placed around the town of Milton Keynes in 27 different locations. And as the uh, learners, the migrants, moved around the town, their um, smartphone uh, recognised that they were near a beacon, and this triggered uh, dialogue-based learning lessons on their smartphone. So they could listen to a dialogue, read the transcript, learn some vocabulary and uh, other things, and then get some recommendations for further activity and practice. And we had a, a trial in which um, the learners experimented with this approach. It's proved to be very well received, uh, very popular. So that's one way of uh, looking at how people can be supported in learning in a city as part of the bigger picture of how the cities of, of, in the future will be organised and how they can support newcomers. So perhaps smart cities in the future and all kinds of new uh, imagined cities um, as well as those that are currently in existence. So it's, uh, I think, a, a full range of possibilities from what's currently possible to visions of the future. Another project that we have worked on uh, was called Mazel Tov. We've written a lot of papers about, about this project to share our experiences. The uh, project was looking at uh, mobile learning among migrants across Europe in different um, countries and cities. And here what was interesting is that we were looking at language learning um, in relation to other daily activities and integrated, if you like, with, with those um, daily activities. So um, workshops took place with the migrants to try and discover what their main needs were um, relating, to, for example, to um, language learning, of course, with translation, navigation, understanding cultural differences, healthcare, and so on. So looking at what resources they might need and what social connections can be provided. This project uh, developed a number of tools and services which were then integrated and presented in a single app. These uh, services that you can see um, on the um, slide now are, were the main services. 
So as I mentioned, there was a social component in terms of finding people willing to help locally, a social network where you could discuss things with other, other migrants and facilitators, some health related resources, a translation tool, uh, a game for um, helping with cultural understanding, language lessons, uh, small short lessons uh, based on dialogues, and navigation guides to help people find their way around the city. So all those tools and services were integrated within a single app and um, this was therefore um, this prototype suite of tools and services in one app, uh, a context aware app that could recognize where the learner was at any given time and make recommendations about um, what, where they could go or what might interest them in, in the vicinity uh, of where they, where they were at any given point. So um, a, a novel approach where the learner uh, was given the opportunity to decide which tools and services they were going to use. But the, and they could also follow the recommendations. So um, we found that people had some uh, difficulty kind of knowing how to use such a complex uh, but interesting tool. They were generally well disposed towards it, but we found different ways of supporting their use of this tool. Um, and scaffolding uh, them with their goal setting was one such approach that we, we trialed. So, um, it became uh, clear from our uh, field trial experiences that uh, there were different kinds of users, some who wanted to explore their environment, uh, others who were particularly keen on uh, communicating with others and um, uh, wanted to engage socially. Um, uh, uh, and so we wanted to um, to help them set their goals and suggest how they can use they could use uh, the tools provided, and that was uh, an approach that seemed to work well. I'm now moving on to talk about um, a project that we then uh, conducted with with teachers. So um, this is important work because. A lot of mobile learning projects focus on learners and teachers can get left behind or um, their needs may not be, be may not be properly met. So here we had support from the British Council for this project to develop a guide for teachers. So it was going it drew on um, the experiences of uh, international students and other uh, newly arrived um, visitors in the UK, uh, looking at their current practices with mobile devices and also teachers' current practices, and bringing that information together to formulate a guide which um, focused on mobile pedagogy. So the idea that the teacher is the designer of learning, but drawing on learner experiences and trying also to stimulate some thinking around how language is changing, uh, how uh, means of communication and connection are, are changing and how activity designs should take that into account. Also in a practical sense, this uh, guide helps teachers to select apps, generic apps or specific language related apps to, to use and uh, supports them in um, mobile activity designs. And uh, the, the, mm, the guide has been used in uh, various workshops, uh, particularly by a, a colleague of mine, Lucy Norris, has um, taken forward this line of work and um, has worked with language teachers across Europe in um, uh, workshops where they've been exploring how to uh, uh, take on this kind of approach. Um, so finally, um, given the limited time we have today, uh, I just propose a few uh, recommendations here for, um, uh, for your consideration. And these are recommendations for learning designs that uh, come uh, from, uh, I suppose, our experience of the various projects that we've been conducting. So this is distilling some, 
some wisdom, if you like, out of those um, projects. And I suppose what's most important is uh, starting with learners' experiences, prior experience of language learning, understanding their learning practices, their, um, their knowledge of how to use a smartphone for learning purposes. Um, and uh, all that is, a, is the basis of any learning design. And then following on from that, developing resources collaboratively with learners, teachers and others who are supporting the learners. Again, uh, uh, an important uh, principle for uh, learning uh, design for um, applications. And um, really also considering how to support uh, individual needs. So something that um, became clear to us as we um, conducted workshops with learners and then had feedback sessions and interviews with them is that um, learners have very particular needs and that uh, it may, be, may not be easy to, um, to identify them. So we may need to dig deeper to really understand what their particular needs are, um, which may not be um, obvious in a, perhaps an initial conversation or, or an initial workshop. Uh, another aspect that's really important is thinking about how learning can be sustained. So if it's integrated with daily life, that's uh, already a good, uh, good starting point. But um, it's going to have to be sustained over time. And um, I think that um, and I think that's going to be important to, um, to think about how to uh, how to sustain that learning through uh, connecting people to a community of other learners, for instance, or um, finding ways to, um, uh, to, for them to engage with their learning, for, with their environment, like the city, like different ways of exploring the city. Um, we also have um, thought about uh, how, uh, how to provide help with situationally useful language. So um, that includes situations that can be foreseen in advance. And um, people will say, well, I can predict that I'll be in this type of situation. But also the un unexpected and the unpredictable situations that arise. And uh, what language do people need um, to deal with that? And finally, last but not least, developing learners' capacity to define their own learning goals. And as I said, that's often a, a new experience for the learners. And um, they may not have thought about their own goals and also the, the, the roles, the um, goals of the group that they are um, perhaps learning with or um, that they're traveling with. So um, engaging with group goals and collaborative learning experiences, which can be supported on mobile devices, but are not so well developed compared with um, individual uh, learning. And uh, OK, so that brings me to the end of uh, this uh, short presentation. And um, I look forward very much to uh, hearing your views and your experiences and uh, if I can answer any questions that arise from this uh, quick review of some of our um, projects, then I'd be very pleased to, uh, to answer them. Okay, thanks Agnes. We'll move to another view and uh, we'll see if we can get some ideas. <coughs> Ask questions to Agnes in the chat, but also we'd like to get some answers from you. And yes. you had a question there. We've set up a, a question for you. Do you see any potential for specific apps for migrants or refugees or for those who support them? So um, based partly on what you've just heard or any um, experiences that you may have in this area, 
uh, do you feel that there is great potential or um, are you dubious about this potential or perhaps feel that it isn't the right, the right way forward? So just uh, get writing. Yeah. Alistair mentioned in the chat earlier that maybe you have to be app literate. Yes, I think this is uh, a point I was uh, trying to raise with regard to people's prior experiences, their their learning experiences, and whether they've had um, some kind of introduction to learning with their smartphone as opposed to um, more traditional means of learning. Someone says they're working on a similar project right now. Um, if you've got anything on the net about it, put it in the chat. Mm -hmm. Be nice yeah. to get a link. Good to hear about that. You've got a question there from Elena in the chat. Yes, so uh, Elena is um, <clears throat> highlighting the fact that people are already using many um, uh, apps for socializing like WhatsApp and uh, that's a good way to support their language learning. Um, indeed, that's uh, something that is definitely coming to the fore a lot more. So when we think about some of um, the earlier projects in this space, uh, they uh, were less, um, less aligned with this, uh, these new practices, but they definitely have, have become more important. Yes, I think uh, things like WhatsApp is very often used for sort of mutual support. And that can often be in their own language, where they sort of support each other's language activities. Because I wondered about your, the the apps you described, Agnes, was there, was there support in other languages? Because sometimes the meta language of an app can be a problem. Yes. Because it's... Absolutely. So uh, the learners were able to change the, the language of the interface, but, but they also did um, use the app in, in small groups where there were speakers of uh, their own, their first language, uh, and, they, and they used a mix of languages. So they were trying to, to an extent to, for example, the Spanish speakers that we had in England, in the, in the UK, um, and in London particularly, they were... Um, they were practiced, some of them were practicing their English, but also some of them were then falling back on Spanish to, uh, for particular problems that they wanted to discuss. So there was a mix of languages. And uh, more, more ideas coming in there, you can see. Uh huh. Yes, that's right. So, um, so. Uh, Someone's uh, mentioned an app called Bitsboard. That's not one I've uh, I've heard of, and I, I shall follow up on that. Um, I wonder what that one does. Uh, connecting um, language learners. Oh, someone's saying not this is not only for migrants but exchange students as well. That that's right, and in fact, the, the many of the students taking part in our the final project that I mentioned were, were students um, coming to study in the UK. Um, so these could be exchange students. We've got a, a link to Erasmus Plus OLS, OLS for refugees there. Unfortunately, the poll um, window here, it doesn't support clickable links. So if whoever wrote that link, if you put it into the chat, then it will be clickable to us all. <laughs> There's Amar who's put in bits board, that's nice. <clears throat> yeah, there's one here that <clears throat> guidance from a teacher, the, the, instructor they they need some 
how to provide on the ground help, not just online, someone to talk to, somebody that do you think that's sort of crucial, or how far can you get with with just the sort of mobile and the app? It needs a network. It needs a, a, a context. Yes, I think that um, for the most, most part, people both want and need um, support that is um, typically uh, developed and provided both online and face to face. Um, so, you know, it's part of their um, integration effort, their um, inclusion um, aspirations. I think also to, to be in, uh, in groups with, with other people and uh, have those face-to-face -face encounters. Um, <coughs> which is not to say that you can't do everything through an app. Uh, many people um, manage to do that very well, especially if they have lots of experience of, of, doing, of using apps for other purposes. And there's an answer here. I think there's a lot of potential, but what about uh, access to devices that can run these apps? That's also an issue. Some people have got them, some people just don't. They have a very old, an old fashioned, an old fashioned uh, mobile that just does text. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, it's it's certainly uh, an issue um, that we've uh, been grappling with in our projects and have uh, frequently had to lend phones to the participants uh, when um, the apps didn't work on their own phones. So I think that is a continuing uh, issue and, uh, and of course, um, approaches that are more generic, like use of WhatsApp and other such technologies, get over some of, some of those constraints. <coughs> and Harriet's put in a link to an interesting Dutch project there. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's a lot of st there's a lot of good work going on on the ground in different okay. countries. I think there, there's you can see there's quite a diversity there. Absolutely, um, it's, it, I think a lot of this has taken off in re in recent years, and uh, it's ex really excellent to see this this work going on. And I should definitely follow up the links. Okay. If you're worried about sort of not keeping up with the chat and everything, you can go back to the recording and take it in your own. You can just stop it and scroll up and down. So don't worry. We will now move over and uh, I'll let Tim take over. But first, uh, the, I have to explain a little bit about, <laughs> I have to explain about Tim. Um, <clears throat> because he's at a conference and we're not sure about the bandwidth, so we've decided that Tim did a plan B, which I think we'll use, because there's a little delay on your signal. And so he has recorded it in advance. Talk about that, you know, plan it, we plan everything. So I will just let the automatic Tim take over now, looking at language MOOCs. But if you ask questions in the chat, the real Tim will be able to answer them at the same time. Language MOOCs for refugees, possibilities and <clears throat> difficulties. I'd like to start off by looking at MOOCs in general. This is a phenomenon which has uh, started in, in 2012 and really since then we've, uh, in the Atlas uh, Research Group, been undertaking different kinds of language MOOCs to actually explore and experiment <coughs> with their uh, possibilities for, for teaching and helping students uh, learn and improve their, their second language uh, competence. Now, some of the research we've undertaken in this process is published in the, the book, which I've got the cover here on the right-hand side of the slide, and this is uh, freely available online, so if you've, you're interested, you can actually go and have a look at uh, some of that uh, work. And it should be noted that there is a, a large number of MOOCs and initiatives and projects related to these questions actually being undertaken at the, at the moment. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, the list of MOOCs, of language MOOCs that were available in February of 2017-85 and the link there to the Moonlight website actually will give you further um, information about related uh, initiatives. So the question that I think we should be looking at here are, is whether um, are standard language MOOCs appropriate for um, refugees? So. Um, we need to think, I think, differentiate between CLIL MOOCs and, and language MOOCs because CLIL, as a lot of you may be aware, stands for Content and Language Integrated Learning, which, if you like, combines or embeds the language learning at the same time that the, the content itself is actually being uh, studied by the, the student. Obviously, the advantages here 
uh, are evident because it enables the student to advance in the content which they're really interested in at the same time they're working on the language skills, but it does require students to have um, a reasonable level of the target language before they actually can, can progress. We're talking about maybe a, a high um, A2 or, or a low B1 to be able to actually get to grips with, uh, with the content. Now, we can scaffold and support this process in using linguistic tools. We can provide them with glossaries, with translation, etc. But it can, um, it can be difficult for them. It's something that we need to, to bear in mind. Language MOOCs um, focus only on, on language learning and um, as I said before a lot of work's actually been, been done on this and perhaps in a way it might seem counterintuitive that if we've got a language MOOC, we've had language MOOCs with 20, 30,000 students on there with practically no presence of a cheetah or tutor that students are actually able to learn anything or improve their, their competence and something we've uh, discovered is that um, this, is, this can in fact uh, take place and often does take place just um, as long as we actually are very careful in the way that the tasks put in the course are actually structured and that, for example, in the peer-to-peer -peer, um, task, we have very carefully um, developed uh, correction rubrics so that they can actually assess and evaluate somebody's production, even if their production themselves may be a little, uh, a little uh, you know, far from, from perfect. So the question about the relevance of, of language MOOCs for, for refugees. What we need to bear in mind here is that um, refugees are under a certain set of uh, very uh, complex and fluid circumstances. I mean, they're, they're crossing borders, they're, they're, they're traveling, they're going from moments of, of, of extreme risk and stress through periods of extended boredom. And uh, they really don't have access to the, the sorts of uh, computer resources that, that one would like to be able to, uh, to study and learn in, a, in, an ideal, uh, in an ideal way. So that question really breaks down into, into two, and that, that, those questions then are, are would they, could they actually learn from mobiles on the road, uh, holding camps, for example, and what would need to actually happen for this to, uh, to take place? And uh, this really, uh, if you like, takes the idea of, um, of support and scaffolding one stage further on. It's a question of uh, actually helping them to um, the access the, the ex external online resources from, from mobile devices, which is the typical tool that they, they actually have available, and to actually help them to preserve their cultural and, and, and linguistic um, integrity while actually participating in these, uh, these sorts of, uh, of courses. And it should be noted that um, there's some research around at the moment. I mean, a classic example is the article which appeared in the Times Higher Education Supplement a while ago, which is a study of a group of Syrian refugees actually saying that they really didn't consider online learning as, a, as, an, as an option for them for, for many different reasons. I mean, the first one was that uh, they didn't, if you like, there's a lack of knowledge or trust of, of uh, who is actually providing this uh, education, where it's coming from, its content, its relevance for them, and also just the day-to-day -day life in a, in a, and the camps is typically noisy and chaotic, and uh, it's really not ideal for studying. And at the same time, there's a, a general belief, yeah, in, at least in the, the group that was uh, questioned, that, uh, that the teachers are actually providing this uh, this uh, learning, if you like, are really not uh, as good as they as they could be. So. The approach we're adopting in, in the Moonlight Project certainly based upon questionnaires that we've given to refugee support groups and uh, also uh, conversations with refugees is the importance of actually channeling this, uh, this learning and channeling them via the NGOs and the, the refugee support groups so that they um, are accepted, if you like, with a... Uh, in a, in a better light before the courses are actually uh, started. And also at the same time, it's also very important to provide the relevant scaffolding and support for these courses and to also highlight the, the recognition and certification element of these uh, particular courses so they can actually see that um, they are actually getting something from this uh, process above and beyond just the knowledge they'll get from the, the courses themselves. So what can we do to actually um, push the envelope, if you like, on the way MOOCs, language MOOCs are developed and deployed. We're looking at this in a, in a, in a three-stage approach within the project. The first of all, if you like, the baseline is that the MOOCs we use should be accessible from mobile devices. Now, there are some mobile clients available, especially for the, the corporate um, 
platform providers, but it's still requiring in a lot of uh, cases a decent bandwidth to be available and um, not, are not necessarily so easy to use in <clears throat> in an offline context or where band bandwidth is limited. So this is something which needs to be addressed. We're also exploring the possibilities of actually um, distributing, deploying the MOOCs via a mobile app or a platform which is not necessarily a standard uh, MOOC platform, which would open up the door to uh, flexible access and, and use. And then, if you like, the third point is the relation of more of mobile assisted language learning to the MOOC because if you like, we can embed more in the MOOC and we can embed the MOOC in, in more and we're exploring that. But really the key point here is the refugee specific adaptability and scaffolding criteria. What is it that we need to do to, to make these courses um, specifically relevant uh, for, for refugees? Now, we've under, undertaken, as, as I briefly mentioned before, um, a series of questionnaires with the refugee support groups and conversations with refugees within the project and we've identified a series of uh, criteria that really need to be uh, um, included or uh, addressed in a particular MOOC if it's going to be relevant for um, refugees. Now, I really don't have the, the time here to go into all of these in, in any detail, but basically here on the slide we've got the, uh, the, the key uh, criteria to, to a general level. I mean, usability and accessibility, if you like, is the ease to which um, uh, people can actually access the course and whether material has to be downloaded, whether it's been designed for uh, mobile devices and accessible in the sense of does it provide subtitles, transcripts um, and aids of this, uh, of this type. Connectivity, um, whether the uh, activities can be undertaken offline and even if you do need to be online um, what kind of connection do you need and whether or there are low resolution alternatives of videos and images available. Um, linguistic criteria, well above and beyond the basic set of, uh, of terms, there are certain kinds of support which is actually uh, required by uh, the students on these courses. Methodological uh, criteria, this is really a macro um, section and there are lots of uh, different points here which is uh, which need to be um, addressed for this particular course to uh, to be uh, to be successful in this uh, in this content and I'm not going to go into any of these more than just noting that what we consider to be a, a key point here is the idea of the duration of the workload that the courses can't last more than four weeks the weekly charge needs to be somewhere between three to six hours and um, a specific activity must last more than uh, 15 minutes. The courses need to be uh, evaluated and accredited and should, if at all possible, form part of uh, uh, larger units of study such as the, uh, the short learning programs which is an initiative being, being handled by the EADTU. And finally the cultural and intercultural and ethical questions. It's actually important that uh, the relevant support and learning opportunities and activities that are provided within the uh, courses are inclusive and, and respectful of the beliefs and behavior, online behaviours of everybody taking part in the, uh, in the course. So this was very brief but uh, it gives you a, an idea of uh, the state of the uh, the art of these questions and where we're going to at the moment. So the next steps for the Moonlight project are to now roll out some language MOOCs for refugees channeled by the refugee support groups which we're doing now, focus on mobile as a MOOC platform and the idea of recognition and certification and um, I think that's what you're going to be seeing us doing over the next uh, few months. Thank you. Okay, we're back to the, the real Tim. <coughs> With microphone switched on. Okay, well, I, I hope you heard that loud and clear. And uh, now it's a quest time to answer another question or ask questions in the chat. So answer a question here, ask in the chat. And uh, Tim...
can uh, do you, can answer them as they come in. What's your experience of language MOOCs as a teacher, a student? Did it help? Did it not help? <clears throat> Is this a good way of helping refugees learn about, try to integrate into the new country, try to get access to education, to employment? I'll just make the, the brief comment while we're waiting for some questions to come in here that um, it's interesting that there are quite a few um, initiatives being undertaken by other European projects, by, by, by corporate players as well, to provide MOOCs for the, the refugees. But uh, one of the things, for example, we've been doing in, in Madrid is actually meeting up with our NGOs and refugee support groups. And we've had uh, more than 20 in now on two occasions. And they're very kindly answer our questionnaires about this information and it's actually surprisingly quite surprising how little they know about them and how uh, how how little information actually gets through to the refugees so while it from perhaps from our perspective there's quite a large offer maybe from their from their side of the table things aren't really quite so clear and also under the circumstances they're not really sure which are the ones they they really should be doing Okay, first answer in, um, yeah, I think they, they can be a flexible way of learning if they're, if they're contextualized and scaffolded correctly. Good question from Paul. Support is so important. Same with the, as with, same with the yeah. uh, apps. Um, There's Paul, yeah. Yeah, to, to answer you, Paul, I, I completely agree. One of the things we've done with our with our questionnaires is target in on exactly what technology um, and data access they have. And for example, it gives you an idea of what I typed in the chat a while ago. The ones that are coming into Spain, for example, 100% of the ones that are in contact with the refugee support groups have mobile technology. Almost 85% of them are, are on the social networks and use, and use WhatsApp. But then when you start to ask for specific other platforms and tools, then they begin to uh, to, to fall out, fall off, because it's not just a question of okay, I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to try to limit the videos and and activities on my MOOC that require um, synchronous online on access. It's, I mean, some stuff can be downloaded, some stuff can't be downloaded, but it's also a question of trying to do it in such a way that the the, the data footprint is as small as possible and 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 flexible. That's a very good uh, point, the, the second answer that's uh, gone into the chat. It also depends on the kind of uh, course, because if you're talking about a CLIL MOOC, for example, when you're scaffolding language learning at the same time that uh, they're learning content, then they would, would have to have at least, a, well, being very generous, a high A2, more, more reasonably um, a B1 level to be able to get anything, anything from that. And from, for a standard X MOOC, then I think you can, you can talk about an A1, uh, level, but if you want to see MOOC, then as we discussed the other day, then in one of our meetings, then that would have to be higher as well. Otherwise, you just don't, don't get any meaningful interactions. And of course, there is quite a good range of MOOCs in other languages, uh, including Ar Arabic. <coughs> but then the yes. difficulty is translating that validating that competence and getting some kind of credentials out of it. Absolutely. To answer the question, uh, the point that's come up in the answers, yeah, you definitely do need to have um, practice the four, the, the four different uh, the competences. I mean, the, the Common European Framework of Reference talks about production comprehension of oral and, and written language. You're, you're not, if you're not training these four competences, then you're not really uh, developing your overall language experience. So if you want to include um, these different competences in, in a MOOC, then you have to provide the relevant tools for that to actually happen. It doesn't necessarily mean that the, con the, uh, the contact contacts have to be synchronous for that to happen, but it does have to be taken into, into account. And um, Alice is completely right that um, I think that's why it's one of the, the uh, important parts of the, of, of the project that, um, that we are trying not only to recognize, but to credit the, uh, the participation in the, in the courses. Karina, Thanks, uh, my Karina, colleague, uh, has a question. 
indeed a very a very good question i think it has to be uh, transverse across the up across the uh, the board one of the things we're looking into is getting the uh, the refugee support groups to extend their their face to face role if you like, as, a, as, a, as supporters into an online um, environment. There also are ref, um, support networks. I've just been talking to somebody here at the, uh, the Tech Refugees Conference who's got a big um, international um, support uh, network and um, very flexible mechanisms for uh, coordinating this participation. So hopefully we can get them on board with the, with the project. But um, the idea of study groups could work. Study groups could work. And, um, I think maybe that's one of the things that I like. I particularly liked about the OLS project was that they had these uh, these online virtual meetings once in a while. And I think if that was moved forward into a, a MOOC kind of uh, uh, context, then it would be very valuable for them. I wonder if uh, Agnes could return into view and uh, join in the discussion, and uh, maybe we we can widen it a little bit and think about. Uh, and we're looking at MOOCs, apps, can they interact? Is there examples of MOOC app, MOOC app interaction? Apps to support MOOCs? Yeah, these um, sort of configurations of different um, devices and approaches is, is, I think, the way forward. Um, but, um, it may also depend on people having access to more than one device in some instances. So I think that's something to think about what's possible on the phone, which is what most people will have access to, um, as opposed to uh, you know, having some sort of combination of devices where you have a look on one device and an app supporting that MOOC activity on another device. <coughs> but I, I'm definitely in favour of the sort of blended learning approach where it can be arranged um, so that you've got the human interaction combined in pieces. It could be though that if you have yeah. an English language MOOC it could offer language support on an app for those whose English maybe was isn't perfect. Yeah. Sort of that that's uh, that type of yeah. link up. Sorry, Tim. <clears throat> or... No, I think it's a, um, a a good point because um, one thing is that um, it does seem to be the case that there's resistance also on a mobile device that we all. I don't know if there's any data to support this or it's just my personal prejudice, but it seems to be the case that most of us have a small number, a core number of apps that we use on our device. I don't know, maybe six plus or minus two. And um, then when we have to take on a new app and start to use it, we might use it for a while, but then we end up parking it. It doesn't sort of become part of our um, of our day-to-day -day life. But uh, for example, I mean, if it's um, understood, for example, that uh, um, refugees are keen on certain social networks, then I wonder if it would be possible to actually run the MOOC from that uh, network or from that communication tool directly and not expect them to have to come across and register into a, another kind of um, online environment. Because also the, the, one of the key things here, I think it's something that um, that John Traxler talks about a lot is this thing that uh, you know it's, it's not like people have always lived in a in a in a free European context so they can freely move around freely express themselves online when they actually come online for learning there's a there's a fair bit of reticence and um, they're not always so open and, and keen to publicly to give their opinions it's something we have to uh, you know be 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 careful about I think. Uh, also, somebody has raised the, the issue of the quality of uh, of apps in Arabic, for example. Um, I mean, that's just one example, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's a feature of these kinds of resources that they don't necessarily have any good quality uh, standards in terms of the, the content or the design of the, the language interaction. Um, and uh, I suppose that's true of MOOCs to an extent as well. So there will be Concerns. There are concerns that people voice around around quality and reliability of the information that's been provided. <coughs> the, 
And Tina's put in a good uh, point about how people really appreciate on MOOCs when there are English transcripts, subtitles, and there are many MOOCs that are offering the people the opportunity to do their own subtitles so that there's, I mean, you can see in TED Talks and in and YouTube, if you want to add subtitles in your own language, you're free to do so. And that gives an opportunity to provide multilingual support to MOOCs. Yeah, I think it's really, really important. Um, you know, it's, it's very easy to assume that everything is in English and that, that's, uh, that's fine, and, and it definitely isn't. <coughs> okay, I think we, uh, we're coming up to uh, four o'clock here in Sweden, and uh, it's time to round off. I'll just change to a final view. You can continue chatting. I'll close the recording in a few minutes and then you can keep chatting off off the record for a little while if you want. Uh, here we'd like you in a way, we could maybe have some little closing remarks from Agnes and Tim in a second. I just say that uh, down here you can write some feedback. Was the sound good? Did everything work? Was it okay? Uh, feedback on the webinar. Bottom left, you've got some useful web links. Bottom right, you've got, uh, you can download Tim's presentation and Agnes's presentation. Use the chat as you want. Uh, a little publicity for an event coming up that uh, Eden are running in two weeks time, European Distance Learning Week. And there is a webinar a day all that week. Some very interesting webinars with some leading experts. So just click on the link and you can find out more and sign up for that. However, um, yeah, some kind of final wise words. Easy to ask, but difficult to say. Yeah, Agnes. Wise words, but uh, I would definitely encourage people to get in touch if they want to um, collaborate with us. We're always um, working on new projects in this space. And we've got a group of um, academics uh, at the Open University um, working on migrant and refugee learning and also part of a wider group on migration. So um, given that quite a lot of people in this uh, session have expressed, um, ha have mentioned that they're already involved in, in work in this area, it would be great to work together. Tim? Um, well, yes, as, as Agnes said, always difficult to try and say anything wise, really. But uh, I think um, I tend to reiterate what Agnes said. I mean, on the on the Moonlight project site, which is in the web links, we've got a resources uh, section. We're trying to document all the projects and initiatives we know about. So if your initiative isn't there, please uh, contact us so, so we can put it there and, and, and just get in contact. Because I think the more that we, we coordinate these uh, activities at a, a higher level, the more productive they're going to be. I mean, one of the, the deliverables, if you like, from this project is, uh, from the Moonlight project, is a, a best practice guide. Um, not just a book, but also, if you like, a, not a meta MOOC, but a MOOC about the whole project process. So um, if you want to get in, involved in, in the preparation or distribution, dissemination of, uh, of this work, then, then we'd really love to, uh, to hear from you. Thank you very much. And uh, don't forget our Facebook group called MOOCs for Social Inclusion and Employability. If you want to join that, then you're welcome. And we'll be posting the recording there and it'll be sent out to everybody who registered for this webinar. So with my voice uh, almost waving farewell over the horizon, I will close the recording. Thank you all for taking part. Thank you especially to Agnes and Tim for excellent contributions. I hope this uh, brings some new contacts. And uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to you all, wherever you may be. Thank you very much.